All right, welcome everyone to Virtual Global Spine. Today, we are excited to have some confounding cases. So radiology and surgical mystery cases. And we've got some of our co-host panelists, everybody here. We are gonna have most of our cases coming from Dr. Mike Galdano. He has some really great mysteries here, which hopefully someone will have the answer to, if not Mike, <laughs> maybe me. But I'm gonna be doing some advancing of the slides. We're gonna be sharing the, the surgeons are gonna be presenting. I'm gonna be saying what I see on the radiology images. Got a few little extra teaching points. Hopefully will be helpful to people and we'll get through as many of these cases as we can, but they're all really interesting. So hopefully you all enjoy this. And if you have questions, comments, put them in the chat. And we'll try to get to those as we go along. Let's start now. All right, first case. Mike, I'm gonna go ahead and play your video. Wait, it's supposed to go to the, there you go. Why don't you start talking? And then yeah, so th this was a um, this was a young girl I took care of about a year ago, last winter. She's um, you know, girl in her early twenties, and she was intoxicated. She was in a pretty pretty bad high speed snowmobile accident, and she came in with pretty bad chest pain, a lot of mid thoracic back pain. Neurologically, she was grossly intact, but she she kind of complained that her legs felt heavy. She had maybe a little bit of pain limited proximal leg weakness. So, um, so we decided to get an MRI and we got a CAT scan. And I think on the next slide, you'll see what the CAT scan looks like. And Wendy, do you want to take us through what, what you see here from your perspective? Yeah. So it looks like you have, I think that was TH that you have, um, a fracture there. So an, kind of an anterior wedge compression fracture, you don't have too much retropulsion of the posterior cortex into the canal. So it kind of looks like a compression, although going through these axial images, I wish I could slow them down, but I don't know how to do that. You have a number, I think, of additional fractures in there of, um, I think you had a pedicle and you had a lamina and you have transverse processes. I think it's, it's a pretty complex fracture. You also have a little bit of um, widening between some of the spinous processes, maybe some ligamentum flavum injury there. So on CT, it doesn't look terribly bad in terms of the column itself but the a number of other small fractures are probably gonna make this a worse injury on MRI than it looks on CT. Now, do you want me right. to go through that video one more time? Do you wanna say anything about it too? Is well, I guess one of the other things too is that uh, to my recollection, I believe she actually had a, a sternal fracture as well. Um, it's a little bit hard to see on this one, but she had um, you know, what, what we call the proverbial, the, the four column spine fracture. She had a lot of chest discomfort. It's a little bit hard to see on this CAT scan, I think. What what are your thoughts, Wendy, about stability and you know um, four column spinal fractures that you see so such as this one? That I'm I, I'm already learning here. This is fantastic because I've actually never heard that term before, and that's something I don't think we usually look at. At least I mean we keep our <laughs> field of view narrow on the spine. You know, if it's a big sternal fracture, we should obviously see it, but it's not something I think we purposely are looking out for. So everybody out there, that's a good point for them to make sure you look for that. But I've not heard of that term. Actually. Right. I mean, we always talk about the thoracic spine inherently being more stable than mm -hmm. cervical and lumbar because uh, of the ribs articulating with the sternum. But if you do have a bad sternal fracture at the same level of a spinal fracture, um, inherently it makes it a bit more unstable. At least that's that's what I was taught by my orthopedic colleagues um, because I did do some training with them. Alex, what do you think about that and Matt? I'm just curious your thoughts. Yeah, um, thank you, Mike. Um, this is the the um, case you posted on Twitter, and I um, I kept my uh, lips closed to, uh, to command the four column model. For me, it's a two column uh, um, fracture because I don't use the word expression three column. But I, I actually I know what you mean. I I, I got your point, and so. Um, when we see this uh, thoracic injuries, and um, we always think that our rib, our uh, thoracic chest, there, uh, the, there is a st in stability plus, uh, but it isn't. It's the opposite. Uh, these fractures are highly unstable, and if you miss them, um, they lead to a severe kyphotic um, angulation, and it's much harder to treat. And to miss these injuries, it's, it's really annoying for the patient. And the risk of a neurological deficit is um, just tremendously increased. We are lucky now to have a patient grossly intact. You mentioned grossly intact, uh, but it was unsure. Um, I think um, from my orthopedic point of view, it's highly unstable. We have to treat this um, 
uh, really carefully and not to miss the instability. Uh, but for me, it's a two column model. So I will not use uh, and I will not support three or four column theories. Uh, but this is just my teachers. Uh, we are Swiss, we are Magal. Um, but I got your point. Uh, everything is injured here. Right. And, and there was every intent to fix this from the get go. I typically would treat these with percutaneous fixation. Um, but she did complain of some leg heaviness. So we, we bit the bullet and we ordered an MRI scan. And, and then we found this rather unusual finding. So what are your thoughts at first glance of this, Wendy, when you see this? Yeah, so this this was great discussion on Twitter and LinkedIn and everything about pe what people kind of thought this was. To me, I mean, there is something in the epidural space, for sure. And I actually, in a couple of slides after your slides, I'm going to show you how, to, how I can support knowing there is something there and what it is. But um, I, I think that uh, it's very, it's a complex fluid collection behind what, T6 to maybe mm, T11. Um, to me, it looks like it is all epidural, pushing everything forward. On your axial images, um, you know, it's putting a little bit of mass effect on the thecal sac. There's no severe cord compression, maybe a little bit. I don't, um, yeah, for exam, I think that was what I posted somewhere. Is I think exam trumps everything in terms of what you're going to do and how rapidly. Um, but you can see this, so you have a sagittal T2. We know this is a T2 because the subcutaneous fat is bright. The CSF is bright. Um, I'm gonna show you the other MRIs in just a second, your, your MRI images. You can see the fractures very nicely of T8 and T9. Um, I think when we went through there, you could see that it was going through the uh, pedicle. Some, it's going in the posterior elements in several places back there too. But um, bright and dark, so different, it could be blood in different phases. It could be who knows what else. I don't know what else it could possibly be. The person doesn't have cancer, they don't have an infection. So it's gotta be blood of different types. Um, well, let me go on to the next slide and we can, if that's okay, and we'll see. May I ask you something at the orthopedic surgeon? When we have a CAT scan of the brain, we always discuss whether there is pressure inside of the cranium. What about radiological um, findings of pressure to the to the cord? Can we see pressure anywhere? Because you always say it's a myelin compression. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, You've we asked can see me that it. before, man. You know I don't know the answer to that, too. <laughs> yes. But do you think it's worth to make some diffusion imaging, some extra sequences? Is there any um, fancy stuff in the research uh, going on with seven Tesla? Do we, do we get smarter? Okay, a word about seven Tesla. The higher in Tesla you get, maybe it's better in the brain, it's worse in the spine. And in fact, we put all of our patients, we can on 1.5, we don't want them on three. So hardware, for most of the reason is hardware because so many people have that. But the seven is not good for the spine for various physics reasons. So I would, I would say not that. Um, diffusion also is extremely difficult in the spine compared to the brain. But that doesn't mean it's not done. I think we can only see things like abscesses or infarcts, though, with diffusion. I don't know if we could see subtle pressure differences, but it's a fantastic idea. And anybody who's watching who wants to pursue that with Dr. Ramagani, I will be very excited to join in. <laughs> so here is another one. This, so, Mike, tell me if this is correct. This looks like a non-contrast T1. Again, correct. subcutaneous fat is bright. There's, CSF is not bright. Epidural something something is bright you can on t1 it can be fat or it can be blood it can be bright so that i'm gonna we'll talk more about that in a minute but any other comments as this one's going through oh is there any reason that after trauma you know radiographically the epidural fat layer may be more pronounced than uh, you know, outside the setting of a trauma. I'm just curious. I I've never seen that before. And I'll get to what, what this was, but I'm oh, just curious your answer. So, to that. I, yeah, somebody, and I think on LinkedIn mentioned like epidural um, plexus engorgement, and that I've seen in the cervical spine. If that, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly what I meant that, though you see on post. But um, other than that, though, I don't know. Yeah, so, so this was a case where, you know, our radiologist calls us urgently as we're looking at the scan It says there's severe spinal cord compression. I even attached our neuroradiology yeah. read on it just, just to show you what they read. They actually read it as subdural blood too. So, 
you know, I was in a bit of a conundrum, right? We have this, this young girl, she's grossly intact, moving everything, but she's saying her legs are heavy. And then we've got this bizarre finding on the MRI scan. And the big question is, you know, do we go in there, do a laminectomy, or do we just, um, you know, do two above, two below, or maybe one above, one below, include the index level T8? I'm just curious, what would you guys do, Alex or Matt? Would you guys perk this, or would you do perk, then maybe like a mini open and just check? Before you guys answer, let me say one thing about the images here, because Mike, I added one of your old, I added something here to one of your slides. Um, and I just want to say one more point about what this, we can see what this is now. So this is a STIR or sa a fat saturated T2 sagittal image. And what happens here, you notice the subcutaneous fat is now dark. Every bit of fat in this picture is now dark. It doesn't have any signal. This was our T1 over here on the right. So this stuff back here, it could have been epidural fat that's bright, or it could have been blood, which can be bright. On this picture right here, we see that it is still bright, which means, remember, fat's all gone, so it's not fat. So that has to be in this space, which white over here, it's white over here, is got to be blood. That's the only thing. That's our problem solving. That's kind of what I, we do for our job, is problem solving with the different sequences, showing us different stuff, and that's the purpose of the STIR. Um, to take out that fat so we can see what is fluid or blood. So that's, I just wanted to show that because everything that is white over here is white over here, which means it's not really fat. So now you can go on with your treatment, please. Yeah, so, so what would you guys do, Alex, Mike, uh, John, would, would you guys still perk this with this finding or would you do a traditional open with a laminectomy and, and do a bit of an exploration? For, for me, this is a, uh, this is a, this is open, uh, two up, two down, something like that. And a limited, uh, uh, you know, either laminectomy or maybe, maybe even a laminotomy to, uh, take a look and a feel first. Um, yeah. Brilliant. For me, it's perk. It's not open. It was just two above, two below from the biomechanics. I completely agree, but I wouldn't decompress if the neurology is really intact. Um, when we have an intoxicated young woman after an accident and she feels like the legs are heavy, this is, this is not really a neurology, isn't it? Um, and I think um, we have seen many of these cases sometimes. Um, in, uh, I've seen them before in my career. And I always have my teacher in mind who did a lot of um, spine surgery without MRI. And when they introduced MRI to the CAT scan in addition, uh, he said it's no benefit at all in the beginning because you're only confused by your findings and you will not make a better decision. Go CAT scan, you see a fracture on a CAT scan, you don't see it very nicely on the MRI. No, we know that uh, this is not the truth, but um, for decision making, I'm going on CAT scan and neurology and clinical findings tell me PERC, perk is good enough. Yeah, Alex, in, in retrospect, I, I completely agree with you, actually. I, I think um, having been neurosurgically trained, and um, the neurosurgeons and audience can agree or disagree, but I, I think we're always inclined to, to decompress if we see pressure on a neural element. That's just kind of the way that we're trained. Um, but I think this is a great example where we probably could have gotten away with perk fixation. So um, I'll tell you what I, what I found. I, I actually found no blood, believe it or not. Um, I went so far as to actually do a durotomy. Um, if you go to, to one of the next slides, I think it shows a picture. It's not from this exact case. This is from a different case I did, but it looked identical to this. What, what it basically I found was kind of shredded epidural fat underneath the ligamentum flavum. Uh, I took T7, I took T8. We found absolutely nothing, brought the ultrasound in. It looked normal. I did a tiny little durotomy and we found absolutely nothing. So there was no epidural blood there was no subdural blood at all. And this is why I presented this case. It was very, very bizarre finding. There was no mass effect at all. And to the point where I'm thinking, you know, am I operating on the wrong level? It was very unusual. Now, and, I'm gonna we, go back for a second. And, and we took her very mm -hmm. close to the time of this MRI scan being completed as well. So it's not like we waited two or three days. I mean, we, we took her pretty quickly. And so that's just amazing to me because there's no way this can be artifact. Yeah. In this case, that's not artifact. And I'll show that in a minute too. Let me um, ask you this, um, Mike, uh, uh, interesting case. Um, did, were the mus was the musculature contused in that area? What would you end up doing, by the way? You just end up going uh, two up, two down or? 
Yeah, yeah. So you could see the post-op film, or or maybe it's the intra-op X-ray, Wendy. I yeah. think it, a couple slides later. I just did two up, two down. I did a Lamy at the index level T8, and I did a um, I did a partial Lamy at T7 as well. I think I took the top of T9. We we just kept looking, and we found yeah. nothing but what just looked like kind of shredded epidural fat that was there, and and that was really it. I found absolutely no blood in the epidural or the subdural space. So uh, till this day, I will always be perplexed. I called our neuroradiologist afterwards. They were just as perplexed as I was. Um, but that's what makes this a diagnostic dilemma case, I guess. Well, let me ask you this. When you got in there, sometimes that blood is under a lot of pressure. And when you just get in there, it kind of, you open up a little opening, just, you know, it just comes right out. And when you suction it, it's, it's gone. That's it. And that, 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 may, that may be why you had a negative, ex maybe you sucked it all out. Because I've, I've had this very similar situation just like this. And, and just with that small laminotomy, virtually, I mean, it was, a, it was a huge epidural hematoma in this uh, patient with ankylosing spondylitis. It extended all the way from the lumbar spine up to like top of the thoracic. And as soon as I did like a laminotomy, this thing just rushed right out. And it was, the vast majority was gone in like probably about five seconds. Yeah, but that, but that should be all clot. Like that, or, that would be all clot though, right? If it's acute epidural blood, like, like it shouldn't necessarily gush out like, like a venous bleed or- Yeah, there was some, there was some, it was a mix. You know, there was like, yeah, there was some clot, but most of it, kind of rushed out like right away. Yeah. I mean, I, I really don't recall. I mean, again, this case was about a year ago, but I was just as perplexed today as I was back then. I, I certainly don't remember doing a little laminotomy and seeing, you know, a, a gush of acute, uh, hyper acute blood come out. Yeah. This, I and I'm, I'm just out. fascinated because I still want to know, like, I know what I see and I know sometimes there are artifacts and I disagree a little bit with what was the reported. Like, and I don't think, I don't think I would say subdural on this. Um, I also don't think I'd say there's cord compression because look at this axial right here. I mean, that cord, it's, it's forward, but it's, you know, they've got a kyphosis. The thoracic cord is always forward. You know, it's not being smushed, um, but you have to go, I know, by what you, by what they say, but also by the symptoms. But um, you also said, I think you said something about fat necrosis. And I don't know what that would look like or if that happens. I don't know if anybody else has had that experience. Is that what you said, Mike, that um, you asked yeah. something like that? Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm just perplexed because, I mean, obviously for a case like this, I don't think any of us would open up the dura on purpose, but th that's how perplexed I was in the situation with that I found absolutely no no blood at all. Uh, no hyperacute blood. I saw no epidural blood clot. It was literally just flavum, epidural fat, and normal appearing dura. Wow. Yeah, because it's a complex signal for sure. So either it's blood of different ages, blood and fluid. And sometimes blood can be black. And so could it be bright blood and black blood? It's, I mean, again, you didn't see anything, but on this picture, we know there's something there. So that's just, I'm fascinated to know. Right. No, I, I, am, I am too. I am too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I don't know if I would have done it differently, you know, ha having known this, um, yeah. like Alex said, I obviously in retrospect, we could have gotten away with two up, two down percutaneously, but uh, nevertheless, a very interesting case okay. that I will never forget. This, and I just, I have a couple extra slides just for you all to see just things that sometimes can fool us. This picture over here, this is a nice article um, about flow related artifacts that you can see in the spine, often a problem and it's on T2 weighted images. So on this picture, and this might be what fooled them, I think into saying there was subdural blood. Can you see the, so the spinal cord for everybody out there who is not as familiar with imaging, the cord is the dark gray the light gray, light or gray, that's kind of discontinuous behind it, that is all flow artifact in the thecal sac behind the core. And then the bright white is epidural space. So you can see on this axial image this, from this article, on your T2, it can look like there's stuff around your cord, but this is a gradient echo, a T2 star image down here, you see there's nothing there. So it's just an MRI physics uh, phenomenon. And you see the same thing for ortho, for Dr. Uh, ortho guys, this is the brain here. This is the brain stem in, inside the brain. But there's just a flow artifact coming through the uh, aqueduct um, into the fourth ventricle. And we have the same phenomenon in the brain. We can have that in the lateral ventricles too. So I just wanted to show that picture. All right, well, you, lo you lost me with all that brain talk. But, yeah, I know, uh, you don't care about that. <laughs> so do you think and, that case, oh, sorry, you have more. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so do you think that case was uh, looking, when you look back at it, do you think it was some artifacts, maybe a little bit of blood and, and the mix kind of made it confusing or what? what, what, what I, well, I definitely think that there's something in the epidural space for sure. What they called, and you didn't see the report, I didn't leave it up there very long, but they said subdural as well. I don't think there was subdural in that case. I think it might've been that flow artifact they were seeing that 
kind of looks, you know, doesn't, right, here are some more examples. Florida effect kind of looks great. Sometimes you might think it's back there. This is a preview for a case that's coming up soon. This is a cord herniation case. This dark stuff behind the cord on the sagittal T2, that's flow artifact. There's not really anything there, even though here's the axle at the same level. The cord is up here. All this gray stuff back here is artifact. So it can be a fooler in a lot of cases. You're like, is that real? Is that not? And you have to do a different kind of a sequence to figure that out. And this first picture is another one where this gray stuff back here is flow artifact. So anyway, I don't know the answer. Um, uh, that's just as I was looking at it, that's kind of what I thought maybe the sort of subdural part there, it was a cooler with that. But I don't, that wasn't all of it for sure. So, oh, this next case. This one's mine. Okay, you all, if you all know this, I will be so impressed. Sorry, I'm sure you will. But um, this was a guy who came, he got transferred in across town, from across town, surgery three weeks ago on his lumbar spine. He had, I think he went back to, home or something, he had increasing pain and suddenly he became very weak in his legs. I don't know the exam as well as you all do, but lumbar spine surgery. I was looking, they got a T-spine MRI as well. So they called me, it, neurosurgery was watching for this guy to come in the ambulance. They let me know well before he even arrived. They said, please let us know as soon as he gets his MRI, let us know what it shows. So this was like on a call day. So I was looking out for this left out part of the history. They said, we're afraid that he is infected. We think he's got an abscess. So that's what I was expecting and looking for. Lumbar spine, I said, this is a disaster. I have no idea what's going on there, but the T-spine. So sagittal T1, sagittal T2, sagittal post-contrast with fat saturation. So all the fat's gone. So everything that's bright is really enhancing. So you can see there's something here. You couldn't see it on the T1, you couldn't see it on the T2, but something enhancing behind the cord. So I called up my neurosurgeon. I said, wow, you're right. There's a huge epidural abscess back there in this case. I don't know what's going on in the thoracic spine because it's a mess and we can never tell what's going on. It looks like he has canal stenosis, compression of the eagle sac multiple levels, but I'm concerned about this T-spine for infection. So this is a little bit bigger view just so you can see it. So for all those of you out there watching who don't maybe know the imaging as well, the cord is gray, cord is gray, cord is gray. CSF is a little bit darker, the bright stuff is posterior, and that's abnormal enhancement. So it's got to be cancer, infection, or subacute blood. Okay. So let me go to the. Oh, that was too far. Sorry, mine skips sometimes, skips ahead. Okay, axials. Does anybody have any ideas on this? Okay, so your axial limit is T1 down here. So cord, nice round, dura right here, fat in the epidural space. This is the post contrast over here, same level. So cord, vessel, this collection that's enhancing. Here's the T2 collection, almost the same as CSF, not quite. Does anybody, I don't think you guys could possibly know this because it's super unusual. Well, I said subdural empyema on Twitter, but you told me I was wrong. So okay. that's not it. So, okay, <laughs> so when I called my neurosurgeon, I said he has a huge, you know, I'm sorry, I said subdural, I apologize. I said epidural, I misspoke, subdural, because it is in the subdural space. He said, well, we don't actually think the guy is infected. Normal CRP ESR. So I but left, that, I left out that part. Abscess. What's that? We have, we have only a homogene contrast enhancement. We have no inside uh, missing contrast with a surrounding contrast. Okay. I thought this would be um, um, the, the definition because an abscess inside has no vessels. There's no contrast inside of the vessel, only surrounding. When it's so clear, homogeneous, uh -huh. it, can't, it can't be an abscess. It cannot be an abscess. You're right. Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> okay, I can, so you I are can, correct. It is not an abscess. You what is it? You don't have to call me. If, uh, I, I, can, I you. can show you an abscess later and... and, and uh, <laughs> It did me went well. <laughs> well, it, well I'm, I'm waiting for this abscess case to come in and they, they show me this and I said there's an abscess. But yes, you're right. It's not. So does anybody know what it is? Then? This is the big mystery case for me. I think this is an amazing case. Okay, so it's the it's CSF intensity. It is just a tiny bit. And I don't know how well people's screens can project this. There's just a little bit of increased signal on the normal T1. Homogeneous, just like Dr. Mamagani said on the post. No angriness in the cord anywhere else. It is not infected. It's not cancer. 
they had had lumbar spine surgery. So this ended up being, this was contrast. All it is is contrast. A month later, completely gone, nothing there. So this is an extremely rare thing. And I'm still trying to figure out how it happens because the subdural space is potential. It's a little bit more complicated than in the brain, I believe. You all, neurosurgeon people know more about this than me. But um, how does contrast get into the spinal subdural space after spine surgery? How is that space opened up? And if it's intravenous contrast, how does it leak in to the subdural space? Does anybody know the answer to this? Was there a fistula, like a CSF venous fistula? No. Well, no. I mean, well, you know, sometimes after lumbar spine surgery, you can get subdural hematomas, right? That's a rare thing I think I saw in the literature. Is that correct? Somehow it opens up the subdural space or? I, I, I've never, I've never seen it. But. Okay. I read that in a couple places. So, um, and I found a couple papers that show this, how you can get gadolinium enhancement in the subdural space. And this couple papers where it's happened in the brain as well. So after angio, um, this person, it, it looks like it's an epid, or I'm sorry, subdural hematoma, but you image them again a couple hours later or 12 hours later, it's gone. So somehow contrast is getting into the subdural space without there being any underlying pathology, except that it was opened somehow by an intervention, whether it's lumbar puncture, whether it's surgery. So none of you have heard of that. So I found there are a couple, there are like two case reports of this. And I, that's what this ended up, it had to have been because they didn't have anything else and it was gone. Um, but I don't think we have time to go into the complexities of the spinal cord, which I was looking at that day forever after trying to figure out how this all happened. But um, I just wanted to see if you all had any insights into that. There was somebody on LinkedIn who said they were going to join our conference who, who knew what it was and said he was going to tell us more about it. I don't know if he's in the chat. Are there any things in the chat? Or is this too hard for everybody? To uh, this, is a, this. this is a patient with a, with a known neurotomy during the case or no? That I do not know because um, he got it across town. So I, he got the surgery across town, so I don't know. Yeah, it's just interesting why it's so remote from the site of surgery and that it's also kind of loculated as well. That, that's, you know, yeah, why, and why so that's it, another why? point. That's what a typical subdural um, looks like. Um, and if you can see on this axial, see that nice, that we know that there's a nice round fecal sac. It's not epidural and it's splitting the dura there. Um, so, I mean, it's not exactly loculated. It's just kind of, in that space. I mean, maybe it's a little bit loculated, but it, I, I would kind of not use that term just because it isn't infected. It's just that space is opened, if that makes sense, kind of semantics. But anybody have any ideas on that one? I want to go Can back you? for a second. See, this yeah, was a pretty, yeah. you said it's remote, but it was pretty, who knows what happened? This looks like the surgery was pretty tough. So my, my one sagittal uh, view, all the Baja's view spine there looks like a hard surgery so all right let's move on i guess nobody can give me the answer to that we'll keep investigating but it's just showing you it doesn't have to be infection or cancer or anything so this was nothing uh, that, that's a great point because uh, it's a good differential for us all to keep in the back of our mind so that we don't go after something that's really not there yeah and he and so our surgeon they went they fixed the lumbar spine the stenosis and the guy was fine and then imaged him again and all the thoracic stuff was gone, didn't touch that, so. All right. Oh, and this is just, I wanted to show this picture because this is showing different compartments of the spine. This was um, anaplastic angiosarcoma mets. So sagittal post-contrast, sagittal T2. And you can see, this is the thecal sac, the line is out here. There's epidural fat or epidural something behind it. This differential signal right here is a loculated collection in the subdural space, compressing the cord. Just a nice view of how we can differentiate different things, epidural, subdural, things like that. So I wanted to show that as a, another companion case as well. All right, so is Koi here or is Koi not? Because I don't know if I can present this case very well, but I can try. Wendy, may I ask you a question? Uh-huh. <clears throat> We um, I, can, I I noticed that all these um, 
um, enhancement is posteriorly and is left-sided. Um, mm -hmm. And we can, uh, the case before, mm -hmm. and um, what we always see is that in some patients, not in every, but in some patients, there is an unspecific inflammation um, going on in the OR side. We um, have some uh, patients who, uh, who get a lumbar puncture and then it's highly elevated protein in, uh, protein in the uh, CSF. We have got cells. Um, people are presenting with headache without having any um, dural tear. I don't know whether my colleagues uh, can agree that we have some kind of um, abacterial meningitis after lumbar spine surgery. Uh, people presenting with a, a, the clinic. And um, I wonder whether we see here uh, some kind of unspecific inflammation. Um, I think the, the biggest um, um, problem, the biggest dilemma is uh, to have lab findings which are normal and uh, MRI which is really high suspicious. But we have sometimes the opposite, that the, the lab is very um, <clears throat> suspicious and the MRI shows nothing. Um, it's, um, it's hard, but I, I, I think it's really um, good to publish all these cases to, to get smarter, but because we have a high number uh, of these findings, but we don't perform MRI of the thoracic spine. Uh, what was the reason for the thoracic spine? Do you know this? Uh, we always get the whole spine. Just because you can, because okay. we can. There was no reason. Oh, so this is standard for you to make the thoracic spine. Okay. Well, so I don't know if that's I don't know if that's the right or wrong thing here, but I don't think they needed that. That's your answer. <laughs> so, all right, and you know that yeah, what you're talking about, we we have seen that before, and that can make the dura enhance, although it's usually marginally enhancing and centrally not enhancing. So this, again, this was just different in that it was homogeneously enhancing. Um, okay, for Coy's case, I know a little bit, I don't know the history so well, but he actually sent me this case when he got it, um, the pictures. So I know it a little bit. Um, I don't know how old the person was, so I'm gonna have to just jump to the picture, but they had a couple years of symptoms. So one to two years, left greater than right, lower extremely tingling, gait imbalance, exam intact. Is that all you guys have to write in your notes? That seems like a very short note. So. This was her MRI though, and this I could need it all. So I, I don't remember how old she was. But does anybody want to take this case before I start talking about it? Anybody here? No? Well, it lo that looks like the. Uh, you have to present it as a case. You can't say the diagnosis. I have to present <laughs> it as a case? You have to say why it is what it is before you say what it is. Well, I, I don't know what it is yet, but I, I see what's called the scalpel sign there. Oh, nice. Wendy? Maybe, maybe. Where it looks like the spinal cord is pushed forward from, I would say one of three things here. My top differential would be a, a dorsal arachnoid web. Um, th there could be an arachnoid cyst, or there could be some type of dural dehiscence in, in the ventral space that would allow the spinal cord to find its way through it, otherwise known as spinal cord herniation. Those would be my top three differentials here. Nice. And I remember, I don't know how long ago it was, a year and a half or so ago, you post a great case on Twitter that I featured in one of these conferences that I think I, I featured your, your tweet in your case because it was something somewhat like this. Right. So yeah, so um, so sagittal T2, subcutaneous fat's bright, the CSF is bright. So I always look first at what is the course of the spinal cord? So it's coming straight down and then something is deviating it forward. What is the contour? Like you just mentioned that scalpel sign. I don't know if this is exactly the scalpel sign, but it is a, an abrupt contour change right here. And it's caliber. So is it being compressed? Is it being pushed forward? Is it being pulled forward? Is it being narrowed? So it is, your differential is perfect. So this is his video. I think from his phone. So coming down through the defect, flow artifact that I was just talking about. That's why it's gray back there. Okay, let's see that one more time and I'm gonna actually stop it when it, um... okay, so oh, that made it go forward, sorry. So when he got to, let's see if I can do this again. Gosh, okay, I can't do that. I can't manage it, but we'll, we'll uh, go on. When he got to this part, 
got to the maximum um, ventral displacement of the cord that actually showed us our answer. So they thought it was an arachnoid cyst, um, which it is not. So they, but they did a myelogram. So I said, I don't think so. Like you said, that scalpel sign is often a sign of an arachnoid web. Um, I actually don't think it's quite that either. Here's our myelogram. So we have contrast coming behind. All the contrast is uniform. We know that there is no mass, no collection behind it. It's not an arachnoid cyst. We also see here that there's contrast in front of the cord here. There's contrast in front of the cord here. There's no contrast in front of the cord at this spot right here. So let me see, here's his myelogram video. And I won't try yeah, to Wendy, stop again. I, mm -hmm. To me, this looks like a, a classic cord herniation on the myelogram. Yes. You know, in, in my experience, when, when the cord is, is completely plastered up against that posterior vertebra body wall, it's almost always cord herniation. Like you said, in the myelogram for dorsal arachnoid web or cyst, there's usually a little thin rim of CSF in front that I've seen. In his pictures, yeah, you can see it kind of squirting out there too. And I, I think I've got a still shot of that. Um, oh, and this is going back yeah, to his original image, which we already described. So this is just your differential, Mike, that I wanted to show real quick. So an arachnoid cyst, so cord, the cord uh, is being coming down straight. It's being pushed forward, kind of uniformly forward, being pushed from the back by this mass. You don't always have the nice outline that you can see on MRI. And sometimes the cyst doesn't even have a full wall. It's partially incomplete. So you can't count on always seeing it when it's like this, it's easy, but it's often not this easy. I talked about flow artifact as a fooler before. This is a way we can tell that there is something back here as well. You can see this gray stuff in the CSF here and down here, not in the middle. So you know there's something different in the middle, something like a mass of some type. So we always get myelogram to prove those. This is just another picture from our other presentation. Um, if you get a myelogram and you do it while they're on the table, they often fill in pretty quickly. So if you do a myelogram and send them to CT, it might already be filled in, it didn't do any good. But if you do the myelogram while they're on the CT gantry, you can often catch this differential filling. So you can see there's contrast above and below, not as much in, and you know there is something else there, and that's an arachnoid cyst. Now this is your scalpel sign. So again, the cord is coming down. All of a sudden, it's got a kind of a very focal um, contour change right here. It's being pushed forward a little bit or being pulled forward, but not a, not a ton. And there is CSF in front of it. So that's your classic um, arachnoid web. Again, floor effect back there. This is a different person, but the same thing. Myelogram was proving it. CSF in front, so we know it's not a herniation. Very focal caliber change, and that was an arachnoid web. That's our picture from a paper we did. Um, so this is Coy's case and what you were just describing, Mike. So um, it comes, the cord at the maximum displacement forward is coming right up to the edge and you don't see any CSF in front of it. And also something unusual about cord herniations that we often see is the cord rotates for some reason. It goes through one side or the other, it doesn't go straight forward. So it rotates a little bit as it's being pulled through. And this is a diagram also from my, my old colleague, Matt Skalski, who did this for us for a paper, just beautiful graphics, but it kind of comes through on one side. And um, this is from the, the literature showing how it's coming out. It's kind of twisting a little bit. And often you'll see, you know, some kind of defect, whether it's a disc or whether it's nuclear trail sign they described a long time ago um, at the site where the inflammation is that caused the dural defect there. And this is a, uh, JR mentioned um, ankylosing spondylitis. This is an ankylosing spondylitis case we got with kind of the same thing down in the lumbar spine with the arachnoid um, or with the uh, cauda equina being herniated eventually. And this is just another nice diagram how it's kind of twisted and pulled through. And this showed how that progressed. This was just like a matter of three years. This guy got worse. Um, ankylosing spondylitis is very strange. But again, just kind of herniation of this into a defect eventually. So enough about that. All right. Oh, and this is extra axial. This is a do not touch lesion. So nice dural sac again, so we're talking about compartments, the dura here. So this is in the epidural space. So this is the uh, um, extra dural arachnoid cyst. And this just more for imaging for anybody who wants to learn more about imaging. When we look for CSF leaks, we get MRIs that have um, heavily T2-weighted MRIs, takes out all the fat. So if this is the epidural space, 
that should all be black on this image, but it's bright, which means it's fluid. And this person had a big CSF leak right here. And that's how we can identify CSF leaks on MRI. So that's another story for another day. But since we're talking about compartments, I want to put that in there. Wendy, someone asked in the chat box if there's any role for a quote unquote dynamic myelogram. So dynamic myelogram, that can mean a couple things. And that again is a whole nother talk. Um, where for for CSF leaks, yes. So um, three different kinds of leaks. You can have it, and you all know this eventually from like a spur, usually in the thoracic spine, which is a fast leak, dural hole, CSF comes out. That MRI to show you identifies those. If you have like a nerve root sleeve that has a little leak, or if you have a dural venous fistula, those you get dynamic myelograms under CT, different ways, either prone or lateral decubitus to identify those. But I don't want to take up our time talking about that today. But yes, there is a role for dynamic myelograms in all things. So that's a short answer. But let's go on to your other cases, Mike, before. Oh, we're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah, this was a 54-year-old guy who uh, presented last July. And uh, he came in with severe neck pain after he had a diving accident, completely intact neurologically. And um, I was not on call at the time. And uh, I was basically roped into the picture about, about three or four months later after the fact, but he was told he had a Jefferson fracture, was put in a hard collar for six weeks, and then basically followed up at one of our mid-level providers. And this was the initial CAT scan that he had. So obviously here's your, here's your C1 arch fracture that you can see here. And um, we'll get to the MRI, which is a little bit more telling next, but I, I, I do think in retrospect, something major was missed with this scan. So I, mean, I can tell ahead, you a couple of things from this scan that, yeah, it's. Sure, go for it. <laughs> so two things you see. One, you knew the vert was out, oh, the right vert. There's no right vert there. I hope somebody knew that. Okay. Yes. And then um, there's a little, I don't want to push pause because I'll stop it, but on your axials here, that little piece of bone. Can you see my arrow when I pointed to that? Or were you not able to see it? No, we could see it. That yep, little point. Right so you already know your transverse ligaments been a vol strike there. I think you could tell right then. I mean, that's the key to stability, right? Is that the key to stability there? At that level? Yes, you, you need your transverse ligament. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're okay. So let me let you go off your story. I think though that already there, you already knew something was going on. Right. And and here's the MRI scan. And if you look at the coronal scan, I think it's on the next one, you'll see that there's a fair amount of, of stir hyperintensity within the C1-2 uh, facet joints. And that's interesting because I've never been in a place where we actually get coronal MRIs. So that was interesting that you, you sent that one. Um, I mean, sometimes I guess if you have a specialized, but we often don't do that. So what, what do you guys think, um, Alex, Matt, um, Jonathan, what would you guys do based off of this scan? You know, it looks like there's some stir hyperintensity within the OC1 joints as well. It looks like that the right C1-2 joint is, is pretty splayed. Would you guys hard collar this or, or would you do an upfront uh, fusion for this? I believe that we have a, um, an upright x-ray as well. Yeah, that's just exactly what I was gonna ask for if you had an upright. Uh... Upper right x-ray. One thing about this one too, this is wider. And I think on MRI, you can tell there's fluid in there. Yeah. Their head is tilted. And that is, can be a fool or a little bit sometimes if somebody didn't say that was abnormal, maybe they thought it was because the head was tilted. I don't know if that ever happens, but I'm just trying to think of reasons why maybe it wasn't called. Yeah, I would um, just um, um, from my, first side uh, first view i would go up front for a c12 fusion um i think the injury of the c12 joint is much more than just the atlas fracture uh, it's not only a bony injury it's also a, a joint injury and i think the patient will um <clears throat> deteriorate um he will not go uh, really good perhaps he will um, have this right-sided um, pain going to the occiput, um, persisting pain uh, with conservative treatment. Um, so uh, the transverse ligament um, is, uh, is injured. So for me, it's a, um, a good indication to go upfront for C12 fusion. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. On, on that open mouth with Antoid view, you can see without the measurements there, it very likely doesn't obey the rule of Spence. So um, that, that's that's pretty unstable as far as I'm concerned without getting inflection extension x-ray. So I agree with you, um, Alex. I, I would do a C1 too. I, I, would, I would discuss with them the, the options, but um, I, would, I would explain that uh, a rigid collar would be very, very highly unlikely to succeed. And um, it just makes the surgery much harder when the patient comes uh, down the road, you know, two, three months later with scar tissue and or, or pseudoarthrosis, it's a totally different operation. When it's here, it's fresh. You can just go right in. The anatomy is good um, and, and just basically just fix it right away. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, uh, Alexander, what technique oh, would you guys use then? What, what technique are you going to use to fix this? I, I, I would just do a, a harms concept. So harms. For, for Atlas fractures, I go for harms. Um, um, I um, learned Margal first, um, but then um, we noticed that you can uh, manipulate uh, the fragments of the atlas much better with harms technique. If you do direct C1 uh, muscle lateralis screws, um, we have had a fantastic talk of uh, last year from a direct C1 osteosynthesis. Um, but in this case, I would do a C1-2 fusion because it's a C1-2 injury, not an isolated atlas, atlas fracture. Um, you remember the guy with the, um, with the MFL uh, football player um, with a classic Jefferson fracture. Um, so when you go for C1-2 um, transarticular, um, you always have to find the perfect trajectory. Um, the patient has no uh, severe hyperlordosis of the C-spine, has no uh, severe hyperkyphosis of the, uh, of the T-spine. So Margal would be possible in this, um, this case too. It's up to you. I think it's a surgeon's decision, but for me, it's a harms. Yeah. I mean, uh, Matthew, a uh, trick on the chat has mentioned that uh, yeah, hard collar lets these, um, lets these heal uh, within uh, uh, you know, three months or so. I mean, I've managed these in a halo before as well and got them to heal in younger patients. And then some of them, you still need to convert them later. And that's where, you know, do you put yourself, do you give them a chance, particularly because a bony avulsion can actually heal back on. Uh, but yeah, that's a, it's a, I don't know if there's any clear papers on this a type of injury uh, for, you know, I think it's a real individual decision. I think this is uh, the good point. This is not an emergency. You don't have to decide within hours. You don't have to go to the surgery uh, right after the accident within six hours because there's no um, neurology. So you have got time um, and you can discuss with the patient as every time in the trauma without really urgent need for surgery. And some patients um, need one, two, three days to, to be convinced, okay, I, I go for surgery. Some refuse surgery at all. And so this was just my recommendation. It's not so that in my hospital, everybody gets the surgery. Discussing with the patient is always um, the best you can do. And uh, the patient decides after getting information for both kind of treatments and conservative works. We know from patients who, when, when the anesthetists say, no, not possible, heart disease, heart failure, coagulation, whatever, um, and um, these patients don't die, um, but they have more pain, uh, in my experience, um, persisting pain from osteoarthritis, C12, than the patients who go uh, for surgery. Those are skiing patients after six months, after 12 months. Uh, I see them cycling, walking, running, skiing um, with a solid fusion, um, and um, it depends what the patient wants. Matt, good one. Did you want to say something? Yeah. I think, am I the only one here that might give this guy, uh, or maybe not, but uh, I, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be, same thing Alex was just saying. I'd be talking to the patient. I'm, I would consider giving this guy a non-operative trial. I mean, I like doing uh, C1, C2 for all the reasons uh, that have been said here. Harms technique, uh, great procedure, great results. But I, I'd be tempted to give this guy a non-operative uh, trial uh, in a collar. Wendy, do you want to go up to the uh, the follow up scan? Oh, th this was a recent paper that came out from, from Hopkins. The rule of Spence is finally ready for retirement. I thought that was appropriate for this case, so you, you could go on to the next slide. <laughs> so here is um here's follow up uh, a, a bit later. This was one month follow up with with one of our mid level providers, 
And unfortunately, the, the findings were missed here. I, I think you could see that the uh, lateral mass of C1 is now has increased overhang and uh, the ADI is now increased as well. So any other additional thoughts, Wendy, about the scan? No, that's, I, this is very abnormal. So I, yeah, I'm kind of surprised the free dental space is too wide, but the, yeah, yeah, so this open I'm, mouth deltoid is, it's a good scan too, good picture. Yeah, so unfortunately yeah. this, this patient was told that they had a stable x-ray uh, and they were allowed to come out of the collar. Um, so now you could fast forward to the scan a few no, months it, later when the patient it was yes, abnormal yeah. before too, though. So maybe they meant stable and that it hadn't widened so much more. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it's 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 stably more. abnormal. Yeah. Right. So here's the next CAT scan when, when I got involved um, several months later. And uh, you could see what, what we see here now. And if you go to the next slide, actually, after this, because this takes like 90 seconds to get through all of it, you could see the comparison of, of the initial CAT scan to the current one. And you could tell us what you see here. Okay, I just like this one when she showed me that this was a movie on this axle because you can see the little bone chip where it's a both. Uh, I mean, that's how we know there's a transverse ligament injury if you can't see the ligament because the bone is not where it's supposed to be. So, um, wow, yeah, that got worse for sure. Okay, is this the next one that you want me to show? This is it, right? Yeah, I wanted you to specifically look at look at the yeah. the, the angle between so, the clivus and the top of C two and what's happening there. Yeah, so I mean you've got the same head angle and everything. Your dense is your odonto is much. It's back farther and higher, right? And you've got a bigger predental space. Yeah, your C one's down farther, in comparison. It almost looks like he's flexing his head, but he's not. I don't think compared to this right. one. So so now you know fast forward several months later, he's got really severe neck pain. He's now out of the hard cervical collar. And, um, you know, he landed in my clinic. So what would you guys do at this point? Would you guys still do C1-2 fusion? Would you do uh, occiput or would you still treat this in the collar? So I take it. <clears throat> so, uh, Michael, um, the, there are two directions. We have the ascension or the, the head is going down or the C2 is coming up. Um, and we have got um, the um, C1 muscle lateralis um, dividing to the lateral. You have to address both. Um, and I think uh, now it's um, a better case for uh, occiput to C3. Um, and this is exactly what Jonathan said. It's uh, uh, probably uh, C1, 2 goes into a bigger problem. And um, I think it's now for me, occipital cervical fusion. Yeah, this is a much more difficult case. This, this you, you took a that's this the whole problem with this kind of a case that you, you took a relatively straightforward case, a, a relatively relatively straightforward C12, and now this is a much more difficult case. I mean, I would try to attempt to C12 again, but I would be ready to very very quickly or rather have a very low threshold converting just to a O to O to two O to three something like that. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Alex. Yeah, the, you know, the issue with these cases I found is that once the, the C1 lateral mass, it, it kind of starts lateralizing as much as it does, yep. it's very yep. difficult to get a screw in there. And um, I'm not very a huge difficult. fan of navigation at baseline for a case like this because of, of, of how um, inaccurate things would be. So we did end up taking him up to the occiput and did exactly what, what you guys talked about there. So like you said, Jonathan, yeah, if, had we taken care of this up front, I think C1-2 would have been perfectly reasonable. Um, but on the same token, you know, should we have treated it conservatively first, like like what previously had been done? I think in retrospect, uh, you know, this was the answer. I think you know, I, I it's that's a very, it's a very gray area with this kind of a case. I, I think a rigid collar is not a wrong decision. Um, you know that that being said, you know, it's something I would I would certainly offer that as a choice to the to the patient. I would you know definitely tell them, listen, what you know, there's certain preferences we would have to watch them very very closely. The very first sign of anything happening, we probably would have to pull the trigger and go for surgery. But you have to make sure as a patient who's you know very compliant, has good follow up, and as someone that's probably going to likely see you, not going to go to you know a mid level clinic and and get lost in the follow up. This is such a great example of why these patients need to be you know followed very closely if you're if you're going to uh, do do conservative management for a case like this because it's very easy for this patient to get lost in the cracks and then you end up with a you know much more challenging case. It looks fantastic, Mike. Yeah, the, the, Jonathan, I, I agree with everything you just said. This is a good example where, um, you know, the residents unfortunately missed this way back in July when the guy came in. Um, the neuroradiologist misread this as well. 
And, um, you know, it just kind of perpetuated, right? When our mid-level saw the patient at six week follow-up, they missed the increased ADI, they missed the rule of spends. Um, so this just kind of perpetuated. So I, I think had this been caught at the six week visit, we could have intervened, gotten away with C12. Uh, instead, now he's got to put the C3, unfortunately. So it's a good, it's a good case um, to learn from. Interesting. You know, how did you deal with, you know, you almost had like, almost like a, almost like a Basler invagination. Didn't you almost have like an odontoid uh, migration right. a little bit there? How, how did you deal with that? Did you, did you uh, distract across uh, C12 or? or uh... Yeah. So, you know, I, I actually didn't, what we did was we, we put him in a Mayfield. I'm kind of old school. I just used a Mayfield and we positioned him in a neutral position. I got an O-arm spin and it looked like it was reduced, actually. I think it was just so unstable that just putting him in a neutral position uh, completely reduced it, actually, and I didn't have to do any maneuvers. Okay. Any last wanted... comments? We're almost out of time, and I want I want Mike to show his last case just because it's so interesting. And then we're going to have a part two of this because we have a very good, audience, a good number of people here today, and um, and uh, JR and, and uh, Alex both have cases, too, that we can show next time. Um, if that's okay. Any last comments before I go on to the last case though? Anything? Okay. I wanted just to, to say, uh, you presenting in the next case? Okay, I will. Oh, I will. go ahead, go ahead, that's okay. I just wanted to mention that conservative treatment is sometimes making decision making harder because patients after trauma have got severe pain in the first days and then they're getting better and better and better and after two weeks or four weeks they really feel less pain but the x-ray is getting worse and worse and worse and so you have this dilemma the clinical dilemma of a patient who is happy that he was not operated and he's doing fine with conservative treatment but then the x-ray gets worse and then after eight weeks, the pain comes back and the pain is getting worse and worse and worse. And so this is a clinical dilemma. And this is why I sometimes really say operative treatment in the beginning is superior to just these games of watching, discussing, watching, and then finally making a decision for a bigger surgery. That's all right, go ahead, Mike, with this last one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be I'll be brief here. This was a 54-year-old that presented to, to me about a year or so ago with uh, bilateral lower extremity pain and, and weakness. She was also having some issues with urinary retention, perianal numbness. And um, she was she grossly intact neurologically. She did about a four out of five proximally. And if you want to go to the next slide, we'll take a peek at her MRI scan. A uh, bit of an unusual finding here that we see. So why don't you go ahead, Wendy? Um, yeah, and this, it, since it wasn't the main point of the thing, I'll just say this, there's this mass, whatever it is, L2, um, intradural mass, T2, kind of hypo-intense, well-marginated filling the canal. Um, then also, though, you have a cross-sectional uh, image here down in the distal thecal sac of something that has the same signal intensity as the mass, but it's kind of a, a layer down here. So that's all I'll say, just so you can you can say more about it. So you can put in your point about what, what the dilemma is. And then uh, do you, what do you think about her right kidney too? Oh, well, yeah, that looks like, I mean, probably more than one one slice, but it looks like a weird thing in that kidney, yes. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so basically she presented what neurological symptoms. We found a renal mass. She had a biopsy and it came back as clear cell carcinoma. So... Here I am thinking, I thought that this was an ependymoma, maybe with some unusual looking drop med or something, which I have seen a couple of times with ependymomas. But then we started thinking maybe this is an intradural metastatic deposit. Ironically, it's at the same exact spinal level at, as the kidney is, right? They're both at L2. So kind of unusual that we could see them both in the same exact cut here. Um, you can go to the next slide. I'll show you what uh, this is the contrasted one. So, uh, Wendy, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about the differentials, A, for the L2 lesion, and more importantly, for that S1, S2 lesion. Well, the S1, S2 is the interesting part of all of this. Um, but yeah, so it's avidly and homogeneously enhancing. Um, it's not necrotic. I mean, I think your differential, you couldn't, you, well, it could be a met from renal cell, but you can't know. I thought your differential was good. It's hard to tell. Um, but in terms of drop mets, that's, that was what interested me. To me, I, and I have a slide at the very end, drop meds for me are always coming from the brain, coming down, and again, maybe that's semantics, but I thought it was always from the posterior fossa, but um, they are usually masses. They are, I do not see them, and it showed on the last pictures more, 
I do not see something that has a layer like this, like a line. This is not a mass. This is like a layer of stuff in the bottom of the fecal sac. So I would not have thought, even though it's the same intensity as that mass, I would not have thought it was the same thing. That right. So give it away. <laughs> yeah. So so I guess again, the big question is, do we need to address anything at S1, S2, right? So I did a laminectomy at L2. And if you go to the next slide, you, you could see uh, this was just for upright x-rays preoperatively. But um, during the surgery, we basically, we unblocked this. And interestingly, this came back as a paraganglioma. Mm -hmm. This was not an ependymoma, it was not a met. This was a paraganglioma. And there actually is a genetic predisposition to paragangliomas in a subset of patients that have um, some types of renal cell carcinoma like this patient did. So after we took that out, we, you know, we, we went down to S1, S2, I decided to do a laminectomy there. And if you go to the next slide, there's, there's a quick video of, of, this is actually from the surgery, what we found. And there was no mass at all. So here's the dura, we, we open up the dura and the arachnoid looks very unusual. So I, I basically opened up the arachnoid separate from the dura, which I usually don't do, but I did it here because it was kind of funny looking. So here's our arachnoid layer. It looks very xanthochromic. We poke a hole in it with an arachnoid knife and we see all of this blood that comes out and the fecal sac, uh, base, uh, the subarachnoid space basically just deflates on us. So what do you guys think about this? Um, it, it ended up being obviously a hematoma and I think the paraganglioma because they are very hypervascular, I think at some point it probably bled and it just settled at the termination of the fecal sac. And we obviously got it all out, but the big question is, you know, did I need to do an S1, S2 laminectomy in the first place to explore this? Or should, should we have had, uh, you know, hematoma, liquefied hematoma higher up under differential? Oh, this year. Oh, this is my case. So while they're thinking, I'll just show you this real quick. This is drop mats. This is kind of trying to prove my point. It's not all the way down in the fecal sac. Drop mats are usually around. Your case this is definitely, this line, no natural mass. I mean, unless you just have cells accumulating and then gelatinizing or something, it wouldn't have that straight line at the top, I don't think. And again, that's just my opinion. I don't know if that's proven in any way. Maybe you all have seen something different than me, but that's just the way I would think about it. Yeah, I, I suspect in retrospect that there was just a hematoma settled at the termination of the fecal sac. There was probably some xanthochromic layered arachnoid adhesion. And then once we penetrated the arachnoid, basically everything just opened up and deflated at that point. So interesting case nonetheless, uh, yeah. but there was no, there was no pathology down here. I took a biopsy down here. This was all negative. The only thing that came back positive was the L2 uh, lesion. Those were such great cases. Thank you so much. And again, like I said, we have more, more from um, Dr. Shmamagani and Rizuli for next time. And maybe, maybe a good one. And Selby will give us some too, because this was fun. And a lot of people were interested in these mystery cases. So I don't know what we have next week. Does anybody know next week? Yeah, I'm hosting uh, Ben Elder from Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. So he's going to be talking to us about preoperative optimization as far as uh, metabolic bone health is concerned. So um, we're all looking forward to that. That's going to be fantastic. Great. Any last comments from our gallery? If not, we'll go ahead and sign off here. We're a few minutes over. But thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks. Thanks, guys.